is carrying the wall, carry my tomb. The only one to hear my song are the coyotes and the wolves. But if I drink enough of this flask, I can hear them sing your song too. All right, hi, this is Robert Leiterman and Kit Morrow from the Bluff Creek Project. We're uh, bringing this to you today at, at, uh, in uh, Six Rivers National Forest. We are off the 12 and 13 road, right at the intersection where 12 and 13 H starts to go down on the film side. And, and Kip, what do we call in this place here we're parked at? We call it the cell phone site. The cell phone site, because unbeknownst to a lot of people, this is where you can get good cell reception. That's why we're here this trip. Uh, because I'm still working, and I'm required to be on some phone calls, and so... It just so happened that this worked out. Which is great. Absolutely. Because we did, well, silly us for a while, not really knowing this worked this well, but since they've added new towers, it actually works better. Crazy. Yeah, it, it's no complaints here because now we get to call our loved ones from this spot. And now you guys know the secret too. Right at the top here, you go down about a good, I'd say about a good quarter mile, you could still get reception and then blinks. You can, and from here all the way to the top, where the, uh, um, what's it called, Cedar Camp Road? Yeah, Cedar Camp Road. I, maybe about a quarter mile in from the Cedar Camp Road, I had strong AT&T four bars of LTE all the way in. So. Well, it's pretty amazing because before we, we didn't have this problem, right? We were like, see you later, honey, and for our significant others, we wouldn't see him, and we'd have to drive like to Willow Creek to make communications. Not anymore, which is kind of cool. So I guess we are definitely spoiled. It, it is. It's it's nice when sometimes it's, it's obviously it's it's good for emergencies and things like that. Oh, right. Yes. Which um, I just saw somebody was um, out in the middle of Nevada somewhere, had a medical emergency, and it yeah. was a two and a half hour drive on dirt roads to get to where they could get a phone call out to get an ambulance and so you know certainly it, it's a, it's a blessing and a curse right right people are so reliant on their phones and on technology and it certainly detracts from you know personal communication or, or, or um, personal connection with right. one another which is you know i just came back from beachfoot and that is at a place called river edge uh campground which is on the sayusla national forest up in oregon and one of the nice things about that is there is no cell coverage. You need to go into town to pick up ice or anything like that. People will travel in to, mm -hmm. to you know, get on get cell coverage so they can call. Right. But the one thing is you you see 60 to 70 people interacting with one another, not with screens in front of them. And I guarantee you, if there was cell phone coverage, people would be buried in their phones. It's just it's the way our culture is. Oh, I, I agree with that. We, we laugh at that television they show all the kids in there ignoring everybody you know got the little phone and without the commercials but in reality i see that in my house now that where you know how phones is like I, I don't text my wife in the same room i try not to do that but <laughs> you know but she's out back you know and i get do i want to want to walk out to go talk to her i'll just ring a little text it'll ring and then she'll get back to me and then yeah but it, exercise is good to walk around that's but, right <laughs> But anyhow, so we're not complaining about the cell. No, no. Yeah, it's good. It's actually a good correction here that makes the safe area a lot safer. In yeah, the long run. agreed. Because like I, when I worked for parks for years, and we had people get lost, and then they rely on their cell phone to get unlost. And then, of course, they got the GPS locators, so we're able to find them. But then they refuse to stay in their one spot because that's where it's pinging, you know. And anyhow, that's a yeah. different story. <laughs> that's old news. I don't do that anymore. <laughs> now I have a real life, right? That's right. Squatching. That's right. <laughs> Great. Well, um, this is our first season back up here in Six Rivers National Forest for 2021 because the last time I was up here was in, I want to say, October. I think you and I and Dustin were at... Kip we, Camp. We, yeah, we spent the last night at Kip Camp on Lonesome Ridge. That's right. That's the last time I was up here because of you know closures and everything else. And that was that was a nice. We actually did a podcast out of Kip Camp. 
we got Dustin suckered in, uh, you know, participating. He's, I'm not going to talk to you guys, but he did. <laughs> it was good. We like right. to do that some more because he has a lot to contribute. Absolutely, he does. But right now, it's just the two of us here. We're kind of a hiatus. We can't get down to the film site right now. We could if we walk. But about, I guess about a mile from the berm, a big fir tree had fallen down about three feet diameter. It's blocking a road for vehicle access. So and then you can you can park there and walk all the way down. That's an extra mile to the half mile to get to the film site. Or you can be real adventurous like uh, Tate and the crew is going to do and hike up from uh, 12 and 13 bridge. Bridge, hike up the creek like Over Roger. Bluff creek. Yeah. Over Bluff Creek and hike up the up the creek like Roger and Bob did on their horseback and their which, drove um, which we did um, several years ago, you and I yeah. and Rowdy. Yeah. Great hike because every time I go up there, I've done it numerous times, but every time I go up there, I see something new I missed before. And that's kind of cool. And uh, actually in the it book that's neat. come out, the Bluff Creek project, project book that's coming out, um, we have sections, pictures in there. You're in, uh, Kip is in those pictures, but we have pictures of us oh. on one of the hikes we went up there because Rowdy takes great photos. He does. And so I go, why not let me use Rowdy's photos versus my low pixelation photos of other things? And so those will be in the book too. That's supposed to be out uh, soon, soon. As Prez asked the other day, Leiterman, when's the book coming out? Yeah, that's <laughs> right. Everybody wants to know. Yeah, it's supposed to be out last year, about October. COVID. We'll just hang it up yeah, on that, that and say it. it's because of COVID. It's COVID. I couldn't get the mask off uh, the book. What it was, are you going to do? Tough, <laughs> Great. So we're going to try something to do a little bit differently here. Now that, that Kip's already finished his lunch, because this probably sounded like he was eating something. He was. Uh, I kind of sprung this on him a little bit. But he had a great solar cooking thingy he used to cook his hot dogs. Did a nice job. Uh, not, not, not to do a commercial for any product, but I'm yeah. looking at it right over there. Yeah. It's amazing. What what is it called? It's called a Go Sun, and it's um, cylindrical. So you know, obviously, hot dogs work very well. But it, I, you know, I've done things. I've cooked biscuits on it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you, you can do anything. It's but it uses the sun. I mean, it's purely there's no no fuel other than just using the sun. Solar. That's cool. And I've got my solar battery, uh, yeah. or generator, I should say, being you know charged right now with um, with the sun. So. Uh, you're pretty high techy. I don't know about that. Well, okay. Well, look, I'll look over to my camp, and, and I think the answer to that is obviously yeah, yes. You're just very high techy. Different high tech. Yeah, I'm low tech. You're high tech <laughs> compared to here. But I don't know if people know this or not, but you're pretty close to retirement. I am very close to retirement. And uh, you got like uh, three months. Three months. It's uh, we're talking today. It's July the eighth, and um, it, literally three months. Uh, mm -hmm. Yesterday was three months and one day, and so. But who's counting, right? That's not me. <laughs> Looking at October the 9th wow. of 2021 as being my last day, after uh, 31 fire seasons. And you so. you earned every every second, every penny of retirement you're gonna get. Well, I hope. I I think that um, I I often re refer to my current situation as just I'm I'm blessed beyond what I deserve, mm. and, but I but I'm thankful for it. Well, I remember my retirement a while back now. It's crazy. It was like uh, 2014. That seems. I know. We were over so at, long yeah, ago. We were in Elk Valley area. <laughs> yeah. The gate was locked. It was November, I think. It was November because I remember. Very cold. Rowdy was with us, and it was so cold his dog was sitting in the fire. <laughs> That's right, Chloe. Yeah. In the fire. It's a little small dog. It's our it's our Bluff Creek mascot. But yeah. Yeah. He'd stay warm. He's in the fire. That it. it under normal circumstances, it would have been dangerous, but it, she was warm. She liked it. It was funny. We, we didn't burn her. It was yeah. good. It was good. And we also had a visit from some of the uh, Forest Service guys. And we did. And they started telling about how these Bigfooters were, like, uh, pulling gates out. Yeah, Remember which that? was um, unfortunately being blamed on the wrong people. But right. that was the assumption. We had a long chat with them. It's funny how they start telling us about these guys who pull out these gates. And they go, and they start talking about how they these you know, irresponsible Bigfoot groups, and they go, uh, we're one of those. Yeah, unfortunately, yeah. or fortunately, we're the, one of what I would consider the more responsible. Yeah, which is good. It's like, they all should be that way. They should all should be respectful and responsible because, like, I've been in law enforcement for a long time, and one action of one officer reflects poorly on all the rest. You know, we have that saying, um, one screw-up destroys a thousand attaboys. Yeah. You know, they focus on, on the... the the one thing that was not done correctly, mm -hmm. but certainly, um, I, I think that it, one of the things that 
if, if I could say Bigfooting suffers from, yeah. is that um, there are a lot of people that get involved that want to get out and go into the woods and go out into the forests and wilderness, but they don't have that backcountry or that, that woods etiquette. They don't understand the <clears throat> the necessity to clean up and, you know, pack it in, you pack it out. Right. And certainly, you know, growing up, you know, our philosophy was leave it cleaner than you found it. So if somebody else left garbage, then we were we were taking that garbage so that whomever was next had a, you know, a, a, an enjoyable experience. But I, I think that people just don't know what they don't know. Right. You know? Certainly we've had uh, issues with people that, um, pardon the expression, but that don't know how to shit in the woods. Surface shitters, I hear it called. That's right. <laughs> So we know one of those. We do know one of those, and I'm not going to name any names, but his name rhymes with eight Aronimus. <laughs> and uh, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll leave it at that. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Well, not to think this is a negative thing to, to throw those stones at our fellow people here, but we also feel that's a way of getting behavior changes. Humor goes a long way, but we're trying to educate people, even in our group, who maybe outdoor skills aren't the highest thing on their list, but it's our job people we hang with we go out with just to you know set them straight teach them how to be nice to the wild areas teach them the etiquette of outdoors people don't know what they don't know that's so true like um i'm retired now but my wife's still working seasonal and she says after the covid 2020 like and now we're looking at 2021 there's people showing up who have no clue of how to even set up a tent how to camp how to pick up stuff what proper etiquette it really is we have a whole group of people who've been sequestered for such a long period of time, and they're out there going crazy. They don't realize that at 10 o'clock at night, when you're camped next to other people, that you know, running a generator or you know, trying to, you know, there's there's just a, a lack of courtesy, but they don't know. Right, and it's, it's so quick to judge people, but it's about. But it's about educating in, right. in a positive way. It's like the left side of my mouth. I'm saying all the bad words about them and the right side of says well how can we prevent this from happening in the future right agreed so i guess you guys out there listening can help us with that mission mission impossible and if you don't know now you know well there you go <laughs> or if you don't know you can always help too but. i think so too well we're gonna try something a little bit different today i've known kip for a long long time it's we we're just talking about this it's i met kip in 2012 2012. 2012. Yep. And we we had mutual friend. Our mutual friend was Bart. And Bart had a, a thermal sighting a while before that. And then I was asked to investigate. Bart Catino, I will just say this. Yeah. Um, one of my favorite people ever. Uh, extremely uh, just an amazing human being. Generous to a fault. Uh, just a great guy. And um, because of him, I kind of started getting involved in, in Bigfoot things. Yeah. And he vouched for me and, and invited me to things. And so, um, so yeah, so Bart is our in common friend. He's our in common friend, and he still is our friend. So very I, much something so. must be going right. Yeah, I'd say so. But um, the whole idea of, of this meeting first. So Bart has this thermal sighting in the Sierras, very close to the kill site. And Bart shares with me his footage. He has three sections of footage that he took because he had to put batteries in three separate times, two separate times, but he had three sections. So he sent me a little clip of this glowing out of focus figure, uh, which was big. It looked like a, a something that you don't normally see in the woods, standing movement through a gap in a tree or standing in one spot where you can barely make it out. Anyhow, so I, I got with Rowdy. We looked at it and we had it all figured out. We figured out that it was people by the campfire. By the campfire, yeah, you're seeing the campfire. Be. That um, they're just walking around getting wood, right? That's and right. and Bart going, well, no, not quite. So, well, you and I were supposed to also go to Washington with Bart. Yes. So, so Bart goes, I changed my mind, which is a brilliant way to do it. He goes, let's go to the Sierras, and we got a team together, and we're going to go investigate my thermal site. So I did a write-up on Bart's thermal sighting that basically says he's sadly mistaken to having to do a write-up after the end of my report, which is a five-day investigation that we did. And I got to meet Kip for the first time. Well, I was having some health issues uh, along the way. I don't know if you remember this or not, but I um, it affected how I looked at things. So when I got to the site, I was not feeling very good. So I talked to Bart about it, and Bart says, 
okay, well, you know, Kip, he, he's like, he's like a medical guy. He's a fireman. Uh, talk to him, you know, he'll keep an eye on you. Like, okay. And so the place we're going to is 7,000 feet about. And if you have any heart conditions or anything, 7,000 feet is not a good place to be just for starters. Air's thinner. Yeah, air's thinner. It's, it's, it's more stress on your system. So, um, I said, okay, no problem. So, uh, I remember that first day getting set up and walking down to check the spring took everything I had to get back up that hill. I remember it was hot. It was dry. I remember seeing Tom Yamaha walking, his little figure, walking on top this ridge, and I just took step by step trying to get back up to it. That's when I really, I think I really seriously gave you a conversation about what was going on. Yeah, it was several days into that. I think you came up and you said, I, I just, I don't, I, I got things. And, it, and you try to encourage me to go see a doctor. I says, no way, I'm fine. And anyhow, that's just a background of the story, but the important part of the story was we had this investigation to do. So I'm going to start out saying we cannot accomplish this investigation because if we didn't have Kip, we would have never gotten as far as we did. Can I, can I step back a, a, a moment? Yeah. So I remember <clears throat> we, we all met at the Bassett's store. At the market, yes. At the market there, and, and, it, and it was a group, and I had never met anybody in person. At that point, I'd only met Bart via Facebook and, and phone calls. Right. And so I got to finally meet him in person. And, and of course, um, Wally Herson was there. That's right. Um, oh. Other people. And so I thought, wow, this is really interesting. And I remember you showed up. And it, and kind of any time I've ever met anybody that's been in law enforcement, they've had kind of a... Uh, and I understand it's, it's I don't want to say standoffish, but it's it's a skeptical. They, they don't know you yet. And so... You know, it's it's going to be very superficial. It's not a warm greeting. It's a, you know, let's wait and see how how things work out. And so, but I remember um, Bart coming up to you and saying, "I want you to destroy my evidence." And that always stuck with me. And I thought, okay, you know, and and I knew what that meant. That meant Bart wanted somebody to come in, and if there was a hole, if there was something that he didn't see. If there was something that that took this uh, this experience and and there was a, an ex explanation for it, he wanted to know, and I thought that was very stand up. I thought that um, you know that that's that should be you know um, what is it? Um, I think it's Thomas uh, Steenberg, uh, you know, long time, uh, you know, very uh, astute uh, Sasquatcher from British Columbia always says. Uh, stick to the facts and never deviate from the facts. Mm -hmm. And so that that was the perfect example of that. That was one of those, okay, let's, if the facts don't line up for what we want them to be, they're still the facts. And so, um, so anyways, I just, I wanted to back up and backtrack. That was, that was my first experience coming yeah. out on a big footing trip. And, um, and it was, it was also, you know, uh, pretty amazing. I, I, I thought that was a, I thought, okay, these are people that I, I, I can respect and I can get behind. So, And what Bart told me, he goes, yeah, uh, you'll, you'll, like, you'll, like, you'll like Kip. He's like a big boy scout. You'll, you'll like him, you know. <laughs> and I did. I, we hit it off really well at first. And I, that was good. And we're still pretty much good friends. You're since, very since good then. friends. Yeah, but I, also the other reason I tease Kip about, the, I, I said the only reason Bart invited you because you're six foot three and he needs to stand in. <laughs> That's it, right. Which is, let's talk real quick about the actual footage so people sure. have an idea if they haven't seen it yet. And the footage was taken in 2012. It was, uh, August. I think it was roughly two weeks prior to when we went up. Was yeah. It, I think it was, it was we were very, in very September. soon after. Yeah, we, were, we went up. No, we went up in July. Yes. Yeah, so this was. Uh, I think that's right. No, I think it was later. Than, no, you're right. I'd have to look to see when, when that thermal footage actually was. Yeah, so it was it was pretty fresh off off the, the the thing, if I may say so. So let's talk real briefly about the footage if people haven't seen it. I already mentioned that there was three segments that Bart took, and in these segments, Bart has a I don't know what brand he has, but he had a pretty good thermal. He, he did have a little bit of trouble with it because it was not probably not as stable as it needed to be. Right. But he went for a, a, a walk with he had a person with him. Walking the outside of this road that was right above the oh, it was um, Son, sorry, Yvonne. So, Son and Bart went up and they got to the position, and Bart was looking down with the thermal, as he always does. But 
the, the only the only thing I'll say, you know, I guess bad about you know Barton's therm is uh, he never carries a tripod to stabilize it. So if he had a tripod, it would have been a lot more clear. I think. Wait, would you agree or? Um, I th- I think it was more. I think certainly that would have helped, but I think that there was distortion because there was a, a, a uh, it was a um, uh, had to do with a programming issue, a, a hardware software issue okay. that needed to get. That's why uh, you got that letter. The, the the email back from the people from Fleur, which we always laugh at. Dear Mister Catino, we're sorry your Bigfoots were blurry. <laughs> It's a classic that letter, is, and that's the truth. That is freaking classic, beyond classic. And it's so true. It's yeah, it's it's kind of like you know, I don't want to say it's demeaning, but it it was you know certainly uh, okay. Uh, you know, it's like it would be like sending somebody an email, uh, dear Mister So and So, we're sorry that your your pictures of your forest fairies were were somewhat blurry. <laughs> Could it be that they're just so fast that it's hard to capture on film? Yeah. Mythical creatures are often very difficult to capture on film. <laughs> and so, yeah. So what I'm saying about Barry is not a bad thing. It's just that we'd like to see him stabilize a little bit more in his hiking things. That's just my opinion. And his new one is, yeah. is much more like, much like what, what I have, my pulsar. Which are nice. And, yeah, it's really nice. Because I was asked to break it down and, and tear it up, and that was one of the suggestions I had for him was to carry around a, a tripod walking stick. Or a monopod. Yeah, a monopod just to keep yeah. it straight. So I threw that out there. But anyhow, so he has the time to, to film this through this gap of two trees, and he watches this glowing figure move in and out of a gap in trees. And while that's going on, there's a stationary glowing figure that's like doesn't move. It barely moves, but it doesn't. It's on the right side. Yeah. And then... Based on the gap there, every once in a while you see a glowing figure move in the back, which the hillside went down and then leveled off and continued down. And when you're looking through the gap in the trees, you can see anything crossing on the back side of this camping area. You would see it in the film. Right. In, in, in the viewing area, which is pretty cool. So that's how we figured that there's probably a minimal of three things out there. Two to three bipedal subjects. Uh, the tallest of which was probably between seven and a half to 800, uh, eight hundred, eight feet. When the smallest was between six and a half and seven. Right. And the tallest person in camp that night was Bart at six foot one. Right. And let's talk about the guys in the camp. So when we did the investigation, is the first question you ask is who was there. And then you get to know the players. And I know most of the players. And the ones I know aren't going to be out trying to hoax as far as I can tell. But when you investigate it, you have to assume that's what they're doing. That's right. You... You, um, much like any kind of criminal investigation, which was obviously this was not, but, but any, any of those, you have to rule out suspects, even though that may, might seem, uh, you know, not logical, but, um, but, you know, you still need to, where were you, what right. time were you there, where were, you know, those types of things so that you can rule them out and move on to the next aspect, and it's not anything personal. No, it's never anything personal. It's just, it's just again, like uh, Thomas Steenberg says, stick to the facts and never deviate from the facts. So here we go. It was kind of cool. So what we did is like, okay, how are we going to do this? Well, in the footage, you have these glowing objects that were flying or tossed or dropped. And so if you're going to say, well, let's be logical about it. Let's go see what's in the area on the ground that can be picked up and heated. And how does it look on the therms? We did that aspect of it. Then we tossed them. We didn't heat up the cow pies and toss them because no. they, they don't. We did the rock drop. We did the rock drop. There were cans there, crushed cans, which don't fly straight. And there's a couple other things. And then there were those uh, white pine cones, I guess. They were there. Yep. And they're not perfectly shaped, and they don't fly. They don't move like whatever did move. We even had filmed uh, Kip throwing a rock and see how it would go and bounce it off a tree. And if you remember, we heated it up. We tried ser- several things to try and mimic the heat that it would have shown. We One did. was tucking it under an armpit. For three hours till waiting for Bart to get back. That's right. But it wouldn't work. No. We it, had to heat it in the fire, if I recall. Yeah, well, actually, we still got the heat under the armpits. Oh, we did. Okay. It wasn't a, a big rock. It was smaller. That was one of the other issues. Okay. Yeah, but so armpit heat works. Yep. For three hours, you, you, you got it. It's 98.6, right? I think that it was also interesting that a person wearing a jacket versus a person not wearing a jacket... 
Right. When, when you had the person stand in the gaps and we wore different types of clothing, you can see the lines in the material. That's right. So, so whatever it was, was not wasn't wearing, wearing any clothing. And then also the fire, we thought was a fire, was not. The fire was tucked away. It was actually an, a person object that I had to stand in for on the ice chest oh, yeah. to try to get the height up. That's right. And we figured it was definitely over six foot and pretty wide for Very that much one. So that was easy to tell. Then we had the rock drop. We had it, we looked for things. We got a couple stumps around there, stacked them up, and had. I think you were standing on it. I was, which put me at close to eight feet. And you were hand dropping just in the same view shed of the same location, and that told us a lot because the guys by the fire heard a thump about the same time it would have been in the video footage when, when he came dropped. back. Yeah. And then they're darting across where some people thought it was a bird flying, and then. Some people say about it refracts off a tree, something hits a tree. So with all this said, we had to try everything just to see if it's going to work. And we did the write-up. And the part that I find kind of interesting is because I'm skeptical by nature, but I've had weird stuff, but I have to be open-minded about it, is we thought originally it's just two, two things, right? But when you start looking at the portals and which direction the thing passes, I shouldn't say portal. People think I'm like, Gaps in the trees. The gaps. The gaps. <laughs> yeah, that's right. As it passes through the gap in the tree, that means it's now on the right side of the sphere, right? That's right. And then you see movement on the left side of the sphere, and then you see that thing that's in the foreground that doesn't move, but it's glowing, and it's probably something. So now you have number three. And then you watch to see which side it passes, and then you see a movement at the far back. So anywhere from three to four individuals right. were caught. At the, on the therm, not all at one time, but over the period of filming and deductive reasoning by drawing a line down the middle of the screen and waiting for something to cross that line. Right. So uh, in three to four, which is makes me wonder about it. And I know the two gentlemen that were at the fire, I know three of them actually. Um, what's his name? It was, was uh, Todd. It was uh, uh, Mike Lorenz. Yeah, he and went then, to bed early. Yep, and then so it would have been um, Todd, Roe, Ro, and... Justin. Justin. Justin was sleeping on the cot by the fire. And then there were the other two people who were, not to say anything negative about them, but I don't think they feel too comfortable out in the darkness away from the fire. And that's another reason well, why they wouldn't. Todd does, but I don't know about Roe. <laughs> yeah, Roe, definitely not. Yeah. To go that far from the fire at that point is like not high on the list. And they didn't need to because the fire was all, firewood was plenty. And, and they were questioning their own, what they were seeing and shadow hearing. wise and right? whatnot. Because they had they'd driven up from Southern California, which was a very long drive. Um, and so they were thinking that it was their tiredness that was kind of messing with their minds. Until Bart gets back. And says, <laughs> and says just act natural, everybody just don't. Don't but, freak. But I think that we're filming two of them right now. I, I knew I it. Knew, I knew it. I knew, no, no, no. <laughs> it's, 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 it's all good. Yeah. Amazing, and then, huh? And then Bart was trying to nonchalantly reload the camera. I'm not reload the camera, but put the new batteries back in. And go back up, up to the to the area to that, you know. And people will say, "Well, how come you just go running in there?" Yeah, that's 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 my money maker about that. Always easy. And so he tried to sneak peeks and saw nothing. So interesting. So anyhow, when the investigation was all done, um, I had to admit there was something unusual and. For people to be up in that area walking around like a bunch of what they said a bunch of college kids hanging out trying to scare people made no sense whatsoever unless they're all butt naked and they're possible? Huge. Yes. Yeah. Is it unlikely? Yes. So with that said on that one, that was an interesting investigation. So um, we also got a chance to do some fun stuff too. We actually went out, uh, you had set some cameras up, so I got to actually learn a little bit more about you. Which is kind of fun. That's right, yeah. Yeah. And then we left there, um, Things were good. And going back to my health issue, because it does play a role in the story, that's why I opened up with it, is about day four, I finally decide that uh, I let Kip take me over to be checked out. Anyhow, it was fine. They figured you just having anxiety issues. But it was kind of cool to, again, bond with, with Kip there. And he, and, and he was the guy there to, to help me out. I didn't ask Kip, hey, Kip, can you do this for me? He, like, volunteered, and he, he tried to encourage me to go and everything else. So, so um, I never thought that we would still have this friendship today not because we don't like each other it's just that because distance we and live time a, and we live a long ways away from each other and even farther now that you're in washington but what we found is that our commonality tends to be our uh our adherence to the law <laughs> and our oh don't and, our, and our boy scout uh, demeanor uh, <laughs> yeah totally are 
Well, you know, not that, that you mentioned that. Not, not that, again, I don't want to throw any stones to point fingers, but um, if there's a fire closure, you can bet that Kip and Robert are not going to have a fire. Um, I can't say that for some of the members, you know. Uh, and it's constant, which goes back to our first talk about our job to explain and guide our fellow outdoorsmen. And, and inform and educate. Yep. Yeah. Because we were at this one place in, in the Sierras by certain people we were there with. And there were fires around us and we were smoked in. But yet, there are members of our group that still wanted a fire. Yes. I was like, what the? And I, I recall telling people because of my the profession I was in. That, yeah. You know, I'm not telling you that you can't. But what I'm saying is if you do, then I can't be here. And I'm okay. Just let me know. And I'll leave. And I got to go home. But I'm no no harm, no foul. But if, if that's something you want to do, then I can't be a part of it. That's the same for me. Like, You know, if you're around people that are, um, you know, doing a lot of illegal drugs or something. Or like, you know, I don't know, like, like smoking marijuana before it was considered legal. Yeah, like, uh, you know what, I see nothing. I just, uh, but I can't be around it. So it's, it's tough when you try to do everything right, you know, and you have members of your group that don't, and you don't want to be a burden to them, but you just hope they show that respect back. I don't know if people know, because there's always things about us that we never say anything, but people know, but I think they know this, that you like to sing. <laughs> yeah. Oh, well, yeah. I like to sing. I don't know how much people like to listen, but I, well, I like you know, to sing in the I, shower. I've said things before on the campfire. He's like, oh, great, don't get, don't get kept singing, man. He won't shut up, you know. <laughs> But he's got a good voice, and I, I asked you before is, right now, here we are, 12 and 13, kicking back in our cell site, just at the start of the 12 and 13H road down to the film site. What song inspires you right now? <laughs> yeah, well, I was just thinking about the, the life of a lonely Bigfooter yeah. who's gone out, had an experience by themselves and yet they become somewhat obsessed trying to figure out what it is that they saw that the world society and everybody else is telling them doesn't exist mm -hmm. and yet there's some sort of uh, dedication passion craze uh, some people call it mental illness no to try and figure out exactly what it was that they saw it's a dam with uh you know friendships relationships other things i think we've all probably can probably point our fingers to one or two that we know of oh yeah that have i don't know about gone off the deep end but certainly have sacrificed a great deal of their their life when they've had this weird experience of seeing something that everybody tells them doesn't exist. Right. Trying to figure out how to prove to the world that they're not crazy. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. So that's what made me think of that. Good. And you have a song you want to share with that? Yeah, sure. I'll give it a shot. Yeah, that's cool. <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> Desperado. Why don't you come to your senses? You've been out riding fences for so long now. Oh, you're a hard one, but I know that you've got your reasons. These things that are pleasing you can hurt you somehow. And don't you draw the queen of diamonds, boy. She'll beat you if she's able. You know, the queen of hearts is always your best bet. And it seems to me some fine things have been laid upon your table. But you only want the ones you can't get. Desperado. Oh, you ain't getting no younger. Your pain and your hunger, they're driving you home. And freedom, oh freedom, well that's just some people talking. 
Your prison is walking through this world all alone. Don't your feet get cold in the winter time? The sky won't snow and the sun won't shine. It's hard to tell the night time from the day. You're losing all your highs and lows. Ain't it funny how the feeling goes away? Desperado. Why don't you come to your senses? Come down from your fences. Open the gate. It may be raining. But there's a rainbow above you. You better let somebody love you. Oh, you better let somebody love you before it's too late. There it is. That was good. I appreciate that. We spent a lot of nights around the fire uh, singing. When Tom Yamaran was around, he'd play his songs and you know, yeah. we could play along with it. I do miss that with Tom because I always bring my flute or my bandaran or my congo or whatever noise-making device I can bring to make noise and pretend like I'm playing along. But that I, I was good. That was good. You've done several songs. We're well, not going to have you sing any more for the people, but <laughs> we'll have to do a special album later. But, <laughs> but uh I've always enjoyed listening to you, hear you sing and that stuff, and oh, it's good. Thanks. Yeah, and it just, just, just keep that up. Well, it's not everybody's cup of tea, but it's always no. just, it's fun. It's, uh, you know, I think that, you know, certain people, you know, you play music, um, it's a release from your, you know, it's kind of, it's kind of letting your soul go a little bit. Yeah. So, and I always encourage people, it's like, man, I don't, you think you sound good, you think you sound bad. You, it doesn't matter. It's coming from your heart. It's coming from your soul. It's it's cleansing. It's it's uh you know to, to that's that it is to me. It's like mm -hmm. you know, you carry a tune. You don't carry a tune, man. Sing if it if it brings joy to your heart. Sing, you know, let it out. So if you carry a tune, you sit by the fire and sing. If you don't carry a tune, you go by the creek and sing. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Or you know, you sing in the shower. I found that if I turn the song a song up loud enough, yeah, I sound pretty good. <laughs> That's, yeah. I sing along and I sound pretty damn good. So, when I first started trying to learn to play the flute, it was always embarrassing to go to places. And I, I like I take it with me because it's a strategy to use music to try to draw things in, right? Sure. So you go to a place. Well, you don't want to be sitting by the fire with your friends and your peers and playing music that you know makes everything run away for, and hide. And you kind of want it to be nice and appropriate. So you go way away from everybody to practice to make it sound okay. So there's your special moment. You're by the creek. You're, you're by the lake. You're away from people. And you're practicing. You practice at home, or you should be. And, and then you, you, you sit there. And now it doesn't matter how it sounds. It's you generating these, these, these tunes. Right. And it's part of you you're sharing with the outdoors. And it's just kind of a cultural thing too, I guess. But you're sharing that with you. And then... You feel good about it. And then, you know, you come back to camp and people go, hey, what was that noise? That's like someone was killing an animal or, or whatever. Uh, one time I was practicing and next thing I know, uh, Jamie's sitting there with a the recorder going. And then he puts it on the uh, Bluff Creek Project, you know, for videos for the longest time. It's just, can you take that down? Oh, it's uh, good. It's good. It, no, take it down. It, it's not. Trust me. I recall a particular um, Sasquatch coffee company. Ah. Uh, commercial work. Oh at, yeah, uh, Twins Lake, Twin Lakes, and I, I picked up a piece of wood and. Oh yes. And it sounded just like a flute. Oh, that was so. Was a fun, I I know I saw it floating around because, so, we got the camera going. I'm standing right behind Kip and I'm playing my flute. And Kip has picked up this piece of stick, and he looks at it and he looks at the lake and he shuds his head and then, you know, takes a sip of his Sasquatch coffee, sets his mug down. And he plays it, and he, he plays it, and he sets it down. And, and my job was every time he brought it to his lips and played it, I, I, had, I had to make some noise so it looked like Kip was playing it. But I liked that. That was a fun commercial. That was fun. Yeah. It was almost reminiscent of the, you bet your balls at Sasquatch Coffee. 
And the other one, we never did get out for the Sasquatch coffee one, is the one where we're sitting around the fire, everybody's asleep, we're at Twin, and you're sitting there, and you're, you're, you're sipping your, your Sasquatch coffee, and you're thinking, hmm. And next thing you know is you give out this loud screaming call, and everybody about falls over themselves, so you wake them all up, and you're sitting there smirking and then drinking your coffee. <laughs> yeah, right. I, I have that somewhere, but we never did circulate it. That, that was a fun one to make. We had everybody in the group join in on that, which is pretty cool. That was a good time. Yeah. Those, those, um, those times at, uh, at Twin, it's a, it's a different place, right? It is a different place. You can access Twin any time of year as long as the slide's off Slate, slate, off slate Creek Road. As long as there, it, it, there's no slide block and you can get in all year round. But it's pretty steep, which means that if you're pulling a two-wheel drive truck, pulling a big trailer and Leiterman's with you and he says, oh, you'll be fine trying to drive out and burn your brakes up. I mean, that's totally different. But um, I, I, that tells a little story because on the off season, I think it was November, we, we, you and I went up to go to Twin Lakes. <laughs> yeah. And so you asked me clearly, oh, can I pull a trailer up there? And I'm like, yeah, no problem. Yeah, it's, you know, one of the steepest paved grades in the United States. Ah, and okay. you're towing with a little tiny truck and it's pouring down rain. Guys, but we got there. We got it, man. Yeah, that's right. Oh, it was a good time. So we get up there and it starts snowing. And it's like on the way up. We were a half mile short of the entrance to Twin. And I said, we're parking right here. It was a good spot. Yeah, it was wide it enough. Did. Yep. And, okay, uh, I'm not used to living in, in uh, comfort, so to speak. Like my tinsel light pad on the ground, I'm good to go. So Kip goes, hey, you know, Robert, you, you can sleep inside. I'm thinking, where am I going to sit my tent up in the snow? You know, that's my going. <laughs> and Kip he goes, oh, you can sit right here. So we did. And I got my place on the floor. And Kip goes, ah. Uh, Skip, also, you actually were making some, uh, you actually fed me, which was pretty cool. Yeah, I had, I had pre-made chili, so all I needed yeah. to do was just heat it up. Which was good. Cornbread. And then you say, hey, uh, you want to watch a movie? I'm like, what? <laughs> That's right. He goes, yeah, I, you know, which movie you want to watch? So I watched the, I, I guess I'm trying to say that was probably late 2012. I think it was still late 2012 when we did that. <laughs> I think it would have been like um, November of that year. Yes. Because yeah. it was after that whole episode of a whatever. Yeah. Yeah. And then you say, hey, Robert, I guess I still like you. You want to come on up? Like, Great. Let's go. You said, well, I guess you're all right. So I guess I will. We survived it. So um, I sat there watching the start new Star Trek movie. That's right. <laughs> on a little tablet. While In the freezing snowing. cold at Twin. At Twin. Yeah. And it's snowing outside. That's right. I was like, this is, doesn't get any better than this. <laughs> and it's warm. I had was, the heater on. It was awesome. And then it's like it stopped snowing. And you go, let's go for a hike. And you're like, what? I go, let's go for a hike. We can walk up the road. It, it was, was it a night hike? It was. It was a yeah, night hike. In the snow. And, and was that the first night hike in the snow you ever taken? It was the first. And were you so excited about going with me? No. <laughs> <laughs> no, not at all. I remember that. You're like, you're like what? I'm sorry. It's, it's warm in here. You know, we're, we just, we just finished watching a movie. Maybe I can yeah, find another one. That's right. You're like, no, let's go for a walk. It's, it'd be cool. But I think let's the begin a tradition of Robert Leiterman. Uh, well, we're just going to go down here. Uh, just it, how far are we going? Uh, it's just right up the road. An hour and a half, two hours later. Almost there. Later. It's like, oh, well, okay. Well, here are we, we are. Are we there yet? How much further? Oh, it's just right up here. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. You're never going to let me forget. The 2014 uh, Flat Iron Lake trip. That was the Robert Leiterman retirement camp out. Right. Yes. We had hiked down into, a few times, we hiked down into Elk Valley. Elk and we Valley. were camped at the gate that was closed. That's where Chloe is freezing to death. Yep. In and we fire. hiked in. And uh, that one particular day, you're, hey, this lake we can go to. And yeah. um, Rowdy ended up, he brought his drone. He brought his drone, got some good shots. And I said, oh, okay, well, where is this place? Oh, it's just right down here. You just go up this thing. And a, okay, well, okay, cool. As I feel like I'm going to die. How much further is it? Oh, you just, it's just right up the thing. You can almost see it. <laughs> God damn well, you man. know how time changes things a little bit? Yes. Yeah, time changed things a little bit for me. But when we got there, you were happy that we were Loved done. it. It's beautiful. Yeah, it was worth it. Amazing view on the top on yeah. that ridge line, looking out over another canyon. Because, like, right where we stopped on the way to Elk Hole, which is a hole way farther out, there's a big old canyon just drops right off the cliffs right there. Yeah. And then you have to navigate around the edge, and the trail's not well-maintained there. 
And so finding and it, the trail is can be challenging. And it's uh, Native American sacred ground, isn't it? Correct. It's, um, it's for not not only the Karuk, but also the Yurok and the Hoopa, I think, all have Hoopa not so there. Hoopa not so much, but, but Yurok, but Yurok and Karuk, Karuk and the Talawa actually have places that are a little closer to the coast there. Oh, okay. But they when when they when they the, the gold road was going through and they're trying to close that area or try to save it. Yeah. And the Forest Service is trying to put in the roads to harvest the timber. Right. Um, a lot of the, the Native American groups got together and tried to protest it area. It's a it is a sacred place, burial place, a sacred place where people go to uh, participate in ceremonies like uh, Bart's uh, retirement or his uh, engagement party or his uh, bachelor party. Well, not those kind of ceremonies, okay. but <laughs> okay, <laughs> but that kind of idea yeah. up there. How many people were there at Bart's? Thing? Oh, going back to Bart thing. Well, that's an interesting thing, but okay. I, you know, when I, when I wrote the book, Bluff Creek Project, I, I got some photos and I was counting heads and some people were missing. But I want to say uh, Derek Randalls was there. He was the only oh, outsider Derek was there. there. Wow. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah. He was the only outsider there. Um, Wally Hersham was there. Uh, um, Did Moneymaker make it? I can't remember if he was there or not. He wasn't in the photos when I was trying to read. No. I know. Um, um, Bobo, Cliff. Bobo, Cliff was there. Bart was there. Bart had a cousin that was with them. Um, Brandon was there. Keel, okay, cool. Um, I'm trying to think of somebody else that was there. I don't know if Tom was there or not. I can't even remember. Yamaron? No. I can't remember. Because, you know, you always rely on the photos, the, the group photos. For remember. To help remember. But What year was that? So that, um, he and Kimmy have all, obviously, you know. This is. They've got Tony and Bella, so they're, right. they're starting to get up there, like, close to teenagers. Right. It was right before he got married, so. 12, 13 years. I ago? can't remember. Something like that. It's been, it's been, it's been a bit. That was well, that place is a special place, and uh, I've been there a few times, and that was during July, and I can't remember. I want to say thirteen. I can't remember now. I got, I got to check. Anyhow, so that was that was. Uh, it was during my. It well, would have been before I met you, though. So he and Kimmy were married when. Oh, um, you're we right. There, it would have been so before been like, thirteen. It would have like been ten or eleven. Yeah. But it was before we were probably looking for the film site. So it was probably before that. Anyhow. Wow. Well, it's been a while. But anyhow, um, that's my birthday week. Right? So it was in late July. And one thing I like to do is just hike around, as you, as you know. And there's a place called Up Towards Chimney Area. And I was just hiking up the trail. And, and basically, it's the section of the trail. There's six miles starting at where the Elk, uh, Elk, Elk Valley. Valley Campground is. Uh-huh. And it is an old road, old jeeped road. And that's the old road that goes all the way through up towards the first pass and works its way all the way over to the other side of the road where they stopped paving it. We almost hiked that, there. if I recall. Didn't we get, we got close. We didn't go all the yeah, way. Yeah, we only went. To, I've done the whole thing before a couple times, and it's about six miles. And it's well easy to follow, and, and, and it gets pretty warm in the summer, and it's just an old jeep trail. But when they declared it a wilderness area, they pretty much backed it right up to that. They, they kept it. Which is good. That's six miles of keeping the Go Road, which is the uh, Gasky Orleans. I see. Uh-huh. Yeah. The whole re- section was supposed to be a, a road to connect the dots. I'm glad it stopped. But a special place up there. But I was walking up to the first pass. And I was about three quarters of the way up. As, and I heard drums. And it doesn't mean, I personally thought it was like, you know, I'm, it's hot. I'm dehydrated and I'm hearing something and I'm hearing things because my blood vessels are pumping in my head saying water water you know right or somebody was playing drums or the sounds there sounded like drums to me kind of like the uh, uh, Bluff Creek at Laos camp you can hear voices yes but you can always hear voices there yeah you can't always hear the drums going up the top and uh, three-quarters of the way up, I, I hear, it sounded like drums. You know the faint? You barely hear it, but you know it's there. And when you got closer to cresting the top, you don't hear it anymore. So it's weird. But we also, while that same trip we were there, we also heard 62 knocks or claps, depending on what they were, uh, in the middle of the night, where we kept hearing... <laughs> moving around our camp. And, and not sounds. just one person heard this. Everybody heard it, and we and Wally had his recorder going, so we actually had recording of it. But you hear it moving on the outskirts of the camp, and it was dark, and it was one of those dark nights. And you, and you, of course, you say, 
well, it can't be a person. It's dark outside, but it could very well be. It's a place that people go up to do special things. You know, it's a sacred high country. So there could have been somebody doing their, their practices up there. But walking through rugged brush with no headlamp and no light at, at night. At night. It, there's always a risk factor if you fall or trip over something. Right. But remember, it's not heavily timbered in a lot of places up there. And you have the stars of the sky, whatever. So there might be enough ambient light to successfully pull that off. But I tell you, it makes you wonder. Because there were 62 of them, not because I counted 62, because the recorder recorded 62. That's wow. how we know. And the talk was, well, they're deer huffs, but pretty loud for deer huffs. And they moved around the whole perimeter of the place, and there was only 62. But it could also have been somebody up there practicing that was moving around at night, clapping their hands together. We don't know because we never saw anything. But it makes you think. You know, we think about this Bigfoot stuff. You know, is it really a Bigfoot? But yet you hear things, and you see things, and you smell things, and you have to ask those questions. What causes that? So here's one of those things. On my birthday, I'm walking up this top of this hill, moving to the ridge, and I hear drums. Okay, interesting. Or let's say that night, or a couple nights afterwards, you hear the clapping or the knocking 62 times around the perimeter of your camp. And all these things start adding up after a while, like there's something different about here. But I'm not saying it was Bigfoot. Just no way I even know it's Bigfoot. Yeah. But we talked to the group earlier where they were over by... Um, on their way to Laos camp, and they heard something knock rocks down above them where they were trying to clear the road off. That's right. And then they heard some movement below them. And again, they didn't see, all they do is heard. So you can speculate all you want, trying to figure out what causes these things, but that's part of the adventure. And what is the thing you like to say? I'm here for that, you have a quote you said. We just talked about it earlier. No, about the ship? Not about the ship. Oh, okay. Something more simple, less philosophical. That uh, I'm oh, I'm here for the, yeah. I'm here to camp and hike and spend time with people that I enjoy the time with. Right. And the Bigfoot thing is just oh, that would be really cool, but it doesn't. If it doesn't happen, then. And, uh, but I also I tell people this: you have a 100 percent better chance of having an experience if you're out in the woods. Correct. Not going to do it from your parents basement even though you know peanut butter and jelly sandwiches by your mom bringing them down to the down to your room it's good and you can argue all you want with everybody mindlessly on <laughs> facebook but the only way you're gonna know for sure is if you come out and spend time in the woods which i th i think is pretty important we as a culture whether you're european or whether you're southeast asian or south american or whatever is we all have our wild areas we go to. We were always were brought. Our ancestors went out, feared the night, embraced the day, hunted, fish gathered. But there are always things they couldn't explain. And there, there are always things that, you know, concern them. We have a little bit in all of us. I guess you could call it instinct, whatever it is. Yeah. But we have lost a lot of those skills over the time because we've gone from living in caves, if you will, to wooden structures, lean-tos, to now we have nice nice houses and some of us have houses have wheels on them and so we've, we've gone and we've changed we don't go out much in the woods we watch a lot of television we get on the internet we get educated by the tv now or the computers but we miss a lot of that fundamental fundamental details we do to sit out by like we're doing right now we're sitting out on chairs in the shade looking at the sun uh watching the uh the, the swallowtail butterflies fly by and listen to those little bee things fly everywhere i mean it's like a television wraparound sound and the wind's blowing through the trees. I could be sitting at home rewiring the, 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 uh, the, the washing machine, you know, or something, you know, and missing out on this. Yeah. I just think that we as humans need to get out. I agree. Life's too short, right? Yeah. Sit behind a TV screen or computer screen or, you know, something like that. I, I agree. I mean, I, that's, I love even just like what we're doing right here is just, you know, it's in a beautiful spot. Yeah. There's a lot of trees. There's a breeze blowing. It's probably low 70s, mid mid 70s maybe. And um, it's quiet. It's nice. It's perfect. We're talking about kind of reflect a little and just, and just be. 
course, we're talking about mid seventies in the shade. Well, we're sitting. <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> it's supposed to get pretty warm this uh, over the weekend. Yeah, because just looking at the place we're at is it's all gravel and it's the ants love it, but it's pretty hard. But um, it gets pretty hot here. But it's nice to be tucked away. But yeah, Kip is absolutely right. This is it's pretty nice. It's like. We're trying to decide whether we want to take my unit and the chainsaw and remove that three foot diameter fir tree that just blocked the 12 and 13 H about a mile from the berm and get it out of the way or sit here and, uh, and relax. Guess we have time to think about that, huh? We got plenty of time to think about that. Well, Kip, I want to thank you for your time. I just kind of a little, you know, banter back and forth, throw out a few past history things that oh, I love it, tie man. us in good this is good I, I enjoy just your company and just hanging out and i always feel like you know because of our friendship we can just we can be there's no expectation of this or that you know we just hang out and have a few laughs and uh talk about things and reconnect and mm -hmm. have a little food and hang out and listen to your beautiful songs occasionally <laughs> on occasion on occasion. <laughs> well, I do appreciate you singing. That was, that was good. Well, thanks. Yeah. It's a little, it's like I said, it's, it takes a little courage to kind of belt it out in front of people, mm -hmm. but then you gotta, you gotta figure that it's, again, it's like, ah, eh, you know, if it's, if it makes your soul happy, then, then do it. Right. Yeah. So yeah. Well, it's pretty important. Well, look, I thank you, Kip. I appreciate it. We still got a few thank more you. days together and we got a few more things to do, but what, I think it's a great way, this podcast thing we started doing. I like the in the field because it's more relaxed. I agree. And being in the environment you're, you're talking about makes a big difference versus sitting there on a phone in a room and looking at a screen and then trying to, you know, go with it. I agree. Yeah, so. Totally. Awesome. Okay, well, thanks, guys. All right, thank you. We've got a few more of these later, but we'll work through it. Yeah. Thanks for listening. Appreciate it. Canyon wall carry my tomb The only one To hear my song Are the coyotes